Wargamers, welcome back to the channel, Death From Above Wargaming. I'm Aaron, and I am here with the most relaxed, lounged man in the world, Tom, and our friend from across the pond, Dom. Uh, and it is another wonderful Sunday morning. We are here with our sixth episode of Jump Point. Uh, so I hope everybody is having a great morning. Uh, we've got some exciting stuff to talk about. We've received a lot of requests, Dom, um, several requests uh, to talk about force building. Uh, so we are going to dig into that a little bit today. Uh, and of course, we'll give you some great other uh, news updates and things along those lines as well per usual. So uh, we're going to start out today with a message from your local sponsor. Guys, don't forget to subscribe, leave a like, leave a comment. Uh, and of course, if you want to get more involved in the channel, head on over to Patreon. Uh, you can help us out there a little as $1 a month. Uh, keeps us going, keeps us fueled, and uh, keeps Tom's weird beanbag obsession uh, funded. We, we told Tom he should have a glass of wine or like a, you know, like a flute of champagne to go along with this, but then we realized it's Sunday morning. Um, so anyway, <laughs> moving forward, let's start with our ready room round table, shall we, gentlemen? So um, let's talk about how we set up a game, uh, because this is important. When we talk about building a force and force selection, I think it's very important uh, to think about how you start your game. Uh, and by that, I mean, do you know what mission you're playing? Uh, do you have a point value set, right? Is it, is it tournament style? Is it narrative style? All of these things. Um, I'll tell you how we set up a game. So typically, like, we'll set up the narrative. Uh, I'll say, all right, you know, Tom, you know, let's let's play a game. I'm thinking it's going to be, you know, your clan Ghost Bear, and it's going to be my Atrian Knights, and, you know, it's going to be set in the, you know, 30, 50s, and, you know, blah, 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 right? And we come up with, like, the overall narrative. Um, and then from there... Uh, you know, we decide, again, part of that, who's attacking, who's defending. We build our lists, we set up the map, and then we decide the mission. So we don't even, I feel like if we, if you decide the mission, then set up the map, and then pick the forces, like, the, the whole thing is, like, far less random, and you're really, you get into that weird thing that we talked about, Tom, I think, in the second or third episode, about how you start to tailor your forces to the mission, um, yeah. you know, like in a tournament, which... You know, then you get specific meta, you get spam lists, you get this, you get that. Like, if you really don't know what mission you're playing, and if you've seen our mission packs, you know they're, you know, it could be a ground control mission. It could be, you know, jumping around the board, uh, trying to get different objectives that go hot. There's, you know, it could be rush to the center and beat the piss out of your opponent. You want to kind of build a, a jack of all trades or at least something that can stand up reasonably well. Um, so typically when we do it, and not always, but typically when we do it, that's the order of operations. All right, so let's... Let's assume that, that that is our baseline for how we select uh, our forces. Now, Tom, when you build a force, do you come up with an overarching strategy or do you just kind of pick what mechs you think are cool or what you have painted in a given faction, a little bit of both? How do you typically do that? So I normally charge money to give up these kind of secrets. Um, but I like you guys, so yeah. It, it, it first off, you know what you have painted definitely dictates what you have available. But within that, you know what I'm really looking for, and we've talked about it before. The primary thing I start with is making sure that I have extreme range coverage. Um, I think there's not there's not a single mission type that doesn't benefit from having full board coverage or as much as you can. So I always try to have at least like two mechs with extreme range, like at least one pip, you know, um, when we're talking about alpha. Right. And then, you know, I, I tend to like to, you know, cluster forces in terms of size and, you know, I, I don't do like a one big and then a bunch of littles or something like that to try to fit in like an oversized mech. That's what you do you're a jerk no i'm kidding um that's an is thing <laughs> i don't do, i don't do that yeah, uh, I know, cause you put all giant mechs, dan does giant. that yeah dan does that all the time he'll take like a kodiak and then like four fire moths like that's a dan yeah. move well, any clan you just can't do that either so, <laughs> right. you know, and then and then what it comes down to a lot of time is learning my lessons with specifically with clan mechs some of them just work better than others for some reason and a lot of it comes down to that 
the thing I always forget to look at, which is like, does it have three pips of internal or four, you know, which makes a big difference in survivability. Right. Um, I don't, I never remember to use jump jets. So I never really think about them too much, but they are pretty useful when you remember to use them. So that would be my, that, you know, that's basically it, you know, I, and then, you know, met, with, with clan, you don't have to think too much about how fast you are because most things are fast enough. But sometimes I surprise myself with how fast some of these mechs are. And that's like always a nice little cherry. Um, makes you feel really good. So if I was smarter, I would think about that more, you know, and, and make a point about it. So no, that's great. What about you? Uh, I mean, you're I think the, all. Master, so. <laughs> No, I mean, I think, I think a lot of that stuff makes, makes sense and resonates. It, it's similar to, I think the process, the one thing I will say is like going to the left of, you know, force design, right before force design even happens when I'm painting my force, I go so far as creating a, like an even distribution of tonnages that I have available. Uh, yeah. I have a spreadsheet of like every faction. Right, and I want to try even coverage from light max all the way up to assault max, right, and vehicles, right, and and yeah. make sure that I have a good, like a good spread there. I think that's really important. You know, we were joking about the the, the sort of the Dan list where there there tends to be like a focal centerpiece mech, um, and then like a bunch of other little things. That's not a bad way to design list. Just to be clear, I think that works, and and he does a really good job because he when he moves and shoots, like he, he does it with that in mind. I don't build lists that way. I tend to do more of the, the, if I can, the even distribution, if anything, I might have like three that are clumped together and like one outlier, like maybe one really little fast mech or like one really big slow mech and then a bunch of five eights, you know, something along those lines. Yeah. <clears throat> Having that it, fast is a nice, is a nice, you know, agreed. And I will tell you a recent battle report we did, I think. I played Oberon Confederation against Dan, and I think he was playing Hell's Horses, and I built a C3 list. And so I was very limited by, like, doubly limited by, you know, what mechs I had painted in the faction, but then also things with C3. And I ended up with, like, this weird, it was like Battlemaster, Catapult, like, it was, like, all over the board. And the Catapult was, like, a 3-5, like, slow as turds mech. It was an awful list. It didn't work, right? So... I would also throw in there, like, just one, you're correct, firepower is king. Board coverage, having options, and having the most number of units that you can fit reasonably in the list without, like, hamstringing yourself is massive, right? The, the more things that you can do in a turn, this is how I build my D&D characters, and it's how I build my, my wargaming list. <laughs> the more things you can do in a turn, the more options you have tactically, the better. Right. Like that's my, that's my like guiding, that's my North star principle. Um, but yeah, I mean, the extreme range thing is huge. I would also, I also don't get focused on like the glitz, right. Unless we're building a specific gimmick list, like the C3 list, I could care less if it's got, you know, reflective armor or case two, like how, you know, how much, what's the point value, how much armor does it have? Like what's its survivability and how much damage can this thing dish out? Um, I don't really want like to build a f and it's fun to do it don't get me wrong but like i'm not going to go out of my way to like find a mech with tag just so i can use like you know, whatever right it's just i feel like it's a waste of points and time um and that strategy may never congeal um so anyway i want to pause there dom you, you i feel like we've been we've been talking a lot any 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 thoughts no, or reactions fine. um i mean I'll, I'll probably just give a little bit of a voice to classic here because obviously you two are the alpha strike destiny crew um i think in classic battle tech positionals is king so like i mean i'm i'm a bit of a weird battle tech player because i'm not really like a crunchy player but i love jump jets i mean i probably am very it'd be quite interesting if we ever could play a game that would be quite fun because i tend just to rock jump jet mechs um i'd probably get absolutely battered in uh in alpha strike but in classic the positional factor is just so massively important and i i tend to kind of base any force around that because if you cannot maneuver into position you cannot win classic battle tech in my experience so i think jump jets 
so so I think that it's it's interesting to me jump jets and this is you know another conversation are over costed and largely useless unless they are the custard, yeah. they're on like a mech like a assassin or a spider where you can go exorbitant distances with them mm. like everyone's like I've got a highlander it's got a jump of three and I can get in your rear arc like you can yeah. get my, you cannot get in my rear arc with a jump of three no you can't. Like, unless I'm standing no, next to you like a moron, and you haven't yeah. acted yet, which, why would I do that? <laughs> but it's just, it's if we're talking about pure classic, though, when you're kind of working off one of those paper sheets, which I don't do, but if you are doing that, they usually designed, those maps are designed to kind of put hills and trees everywhere. So, like, where you don't it's, get that in Alpha Strike, right? Like, you, it's right. much more barren, and there's much more area to kind of run in, and it makes it faster, so. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. Um, the other thing I want to talk about for a minute is um, Mega Mech. I want to talk about how I always research using Mega Mech and Sarna and Master Unit List to figure out what exactly what variants are available to me. So, you know, if if we're if we're looking at you know a certain force and I decide like I want to I want to bring a Marauder, there's like thirty five thousand Marauder variants, right? Uh, now you can if you're playing Alpha Strike, which we we play Alpha Strike, right? Uh, we play Destiny. We do. We used to play Classic a lot, but <clears throat> I would go. You know, for Alpha Strike, it's easy. You go on Master Unit List, and you know, I mean, honestly, half of them are the same. Which is a, which is a uh, we talked about this in Alpha Strike Detractor. You know, they're like all three. You know, whatever three three twos or whatever. There's some some variations like whatever. Like cool, but if I'm playing Destiny or I'm playing Classic. I most certainly want to understand what the loadouts are because it's it wildly impacts these things. And we all know BV doesn't always reflect the capabilities of the mech or you know what you think is good or what might be good in the context of the land. So I, I highly recommend all of those tools, you know, going on Sarna and researching. Um, it's very easy to kind of scroll through and be like, ah, this one's got the 20 yard PPCs. Let me go pull it up in Mega Mech. Oh, it's only got one heat sink. Like, let me let me skip that one. Right, whatever. <laughs> um, so those those are kind of you know those are kind of uh, useful tools as well. I think. Um, anyway, so let's jump into our patron Q and A. Say what? Uh, so this one is from uh, someone on our Discord, uh, Lord Humongous. At, at, he asked, "At what point is it no longer a house rule, but rather?" an enforcement of doctrine to poor choices on the part of the players. So this was in, in the context, Tom, of, of way back, we did an, an Alpha Strike battle report where we each took two alpha, um, aerospace fighters, right? And he was like, you know, whoop. and I, we were talking about, we were having a great conversation about how it, it, it can be a little bit unbalanced if like one player takes uh, aerospace and the other one doesn't. And he's like, you know, so at what point is it like, yeah, so and I was like, well, generally we house rule like now if one person takes another per right? If you know you have to, you know, fight in the air before you know, we talked about all of those different things. We never we never none of them really came to fruition, but we were talking about it. So I'll start with you, Tom. What do you think? Like at what point do do house rules or even tournament rules, right? Um, become enforcement of, you know, to, to prevent, you know, sort of the poor choices from happening versus something to really enhance the game. What are your thoughts yeah, on it? Yeah. In some ways, it depends on your player group. Um, like, if you have a player who is just not on the same page and, and you need to somehow get them, you know, then a house rule is really trying to tailor a, a player. Um, and, and I've seen that happen. Even in, like, D&D, &D, for example, you know, people who are trying... Yeah, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But... You know, you have somebody that's like, I'm going to make this, like, shard elemental character. You're like, we're playing in a low magic environment. You just, that's a, you're never going to be able to interact with anybody because they're going to scream and run, you right. know. Um, it's, it's a great example of that. So, like, you have to put boundaries around that because somebody just, like, isn't getting the, the hint. Um, for the most part, I, I think we, and we stress this constantly in the comments on Discord and everything. When we make house rules, it's really down to like, you know, either math or probabilities, which is, I guess, math, and or or really trying to make it, you know, balanced and, and not balanced to our preferences, but balanced in in like a holistic sense. 
Um, we, we make great pains and we talk endlessly about all of those rules and how they fit to not do that. Um, so I would say in DFA's um, position, we, we almost everything that we put out as a house rule or a DFA rule is really not focused on any of our sort of idiosyncrasies. Yeah. Yeah. And Dom, you know, follow up question for you. Um, you know, should these house rules be necessary or should the game be balanced well enough that these things shouldn't be necessary? Your, your thoughts? Um, so I think, generally speaking, I think balancing games is massively overrated. Uh, I'm, I mean, yeah, I think, you know, I my, my ethos on gaming is I'm there to kind of have fun, which I know is like, that's my own little idiosyncrasy, right? But I, I'm not bothered if a game is not balanced. I mean, it's why I like Battletech, right? Because it's absolutely not balanced, but it's fun. But if you're playing in a tournament setting, like 100%, you absolutely need like a TO to be on it. And they need to know like the current meta and they need to know that like, it, like it's human nature, right? If you allow someone just to do anything, they'll, they'll just research it. They'll get like a mid max list and they'll just rock it until, and that's what maybe like 60% of the players will do that. And then the other 40% will just have a miserable time. And it's, I suppose you say you have a miserable time. You can still get really badly beaten in tabletop and just have massive amounts of fun. I mean, it's just a mindset thing, right? But like, I think if you are going to, if you want it so everyone rocks up and it's kind of at least just fair, you, if you just say, oh, you can bring as much infantry as you want, there is literally going to be that person who rocks up with, you know, 15 platoons of flamer infantry and transports, like, you know, like, or like worse when you've got people like, um, using air transport to drop parachute infantry behind, like whoa, you're whoa, gonna whoa, get whoa, that, whoa. and it's just gonna be, whoa, 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 that's English for stop a horse. Whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> All right, so let's move into our interstellar news. So Dom, um, a couple of exciting things dropped, uh, and I know we're a little late on this, but there's always exciting things. So this was an update from early January, um, and there were a couple like everyone was like, wow, Kickstarter, but there were like these little secret like. Yeah. Like nuggets in there. Tell us about them. So, and this was very exciting to me because um, it's one of my favorite things in Battletech. Um, if you kind of read the, the news, it, we spoke about it in the last episode, right? It was the kind of, I suppose, like the State of Union address from the, the Battletech world and how many models they've sold recently. Yes, like yes. That. But there was like literally, and it kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the last episode about the. Um, Kind of interesting marketing techniques. They literally dropped this one line about that they were releasing the Snow to Regulars um, like Force Pack, which, not to sound too much of a fanboy about it, but I absolutely adore the Snow to, Reg Snow to Regulars. I love the lore about them. Uh, they're really cool. They're really interesting as well. I mean, I'll give you a very quick lore synopsis, literally 10 seconds, but like, I have a conspiracy theory about the. Snows regulars, I think they're clan um, Goliath Scorpion or Scorpion Goliath, whatever they call themselves, yeah. uh, who are like the treasure hunters in uh, in Battletech, and they're a very big like treasure hunty. Uh, this is completely my theory, by the way. I agree with them. There's no like official thing for this, but if you kind of if you're playing them on tabletop, because they're kind of attached to the Wolf Dragoons, um, it's go and read it right the wonderful lot of the snows are regulars and we get in that force pack and you're probably going to get in there things like a highlander um an archer shadow hawk uh they're kind of their like prerequisite mechs um but they also listed in there as well that we're getting this like random though they were like oh we're also getting this random force pack so they've not disclosed what it is and i thought it'd be fun to kind of speculate on some of that and if you kind of go through all the the pictures from that news release they are releasing like dice packs. So you're getting like the um, the Hanson's Rough Riders. There was kind of a little, I mean, it's like a little circular set of dice. But one of them that I saw there, and another one of my favorite outfits in Battletech are uh, the Blackthorns, which you may or may not have come across. I don't know how um, like common, I think there's, there's very good books on the Blackthorns. They're basically like an anti-clan unit. So I automatically love them. Um, they've got a really cool logo as well. and I. That's my one thing. I was like, is this dice pack going to run alongside the, the Blackthorns Mercenary pack? Is that going to be something that they announce? 
Uh, or is it going to be something um, like maybe a, a force pack for one of the, the like major forces? Like, are we going to get like the Draconis Combine force pack where you get like a Jenna, a Panther, a Dragon, and a you know Hatamochi or something like that? There's also an Urban Mech Lance I saw in there too, um, and and on Scroggins there Patreon is. there was a bunch of like random ass Urban Mechs like with an MRM thirty and stuff. Um, so who knows? Yep. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Let's go on to our next segment. This is a brand new segment. Uh, it's called Optional Rules Lawyer. I object. Even I object. So here we are. <laughs> uh, let's go and talk about, we're going to talk about, we're going to pick an optional rule. We're going to talk about it. Uh, briefly give you our two cents on is it worth including in the game or not. Uh, Dom, what is our first optional rules lawyer that we are going to uh, look at here? So we're going to talk about floating criticals, mm. um, which is a, for me, I think the in classic, just to say if this is um, specific to classic, right. the the actual rule is written on floor, uh, sorry, on criticals in general is that they all, you know, if you kind of score that um, snake eyes, then it goes through to the, the center torso. And that can be obviously quite brutal because uh, then you're kind of looking at like engine and um, gyro hits, which can like really cripple your mech. And the chances are, obviously, because you're probably going to roll a seven, so that's what you usually get on 2d6. So you will still go through to the center torso, but there is a chance of getting that head hit or that leg hit or whatever else. And that just makes it a lot more fun because, uh, you know, it's like it just gives a little bit more of like randomness to, to the game. But one of the massive thing on it, and this is kind of works in synergy with another rule. Uh, or like an ex uh, an expanded rule that you can use, which you should be if you're not doing this, you should do, and that's the the force withdrawal rules. And there's, I mean, I'm not going to go into it here because it's a bit outside the context. But basically, like rather than just fighting to the death, which is just takes ages in classic, and it wouldn't happen anyway in a law sense, uh, the mechs will withdraw or force withdrawal when they get X amount of damage or if they lose a side torso. And I think there are kind of rules on it, like if you get like an engine hit and a gyro hit, the mech is forced to withdraw. If you are doing force withdrawal rules, I would highly advise you tie that in with crit with floating criticals. Uh, they work really well with each other. Um, so yeah, and and do you know? I, I'd advise everyone do that anyway. Like, don't just keep to the core rules. Once you really get into battle tech, have a look around. Have a look at the different gaming systems, whether it's like Alpha Strike or Destiny, because you'll be able to pick cherry pick things out and really kind of make a, a much better gaming experience for yourself. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for that. Uh, we are going to move into our render blender now. Uh, but I will say this. I will say this. Uh, the floating criticals is the only way we play, uh, both in classic yes. and in destiny. Uh, it's it's the only way to go. But Tom, speaking of floating criticals, can I stay uh, in my, my beanbag, or do I have to actually get up for this? You can stay in your beanbag. <laughs> is it is it comfortable? As long as you can see the screen. I, I am literally on the verge of falling asleep. This is looks so time. comfortable. It looks so comfortable. <laughs> so we're going to look at the Kraken today. So this is a uh, this is a beast. Uh, this is a second line clan mech, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I believe that the fault configuration is six thousand four hundred and ninety two ultra auto cannon twos. Uh, <laughs> give or, give no, or no, take. That's, that's not enough. It's got more than that. More than that. <laughs> it has an obscene number of auto cannon twos. Uh, there's another configuration with with a crazy number of LRM 15s or 10s or something. Uh, it's just a hilarious mech. I love the fact that this one is uh, is uh, hopefully coming out in the in the Kickstarter. I don't know if it's on the official list or not. I think it is though. Um, it but is, Tom, I think yeah. Here, here she blows. Uh, now I'm gonna yeah. just quickly go through the three yeah. uh, renders that I have. And again, guys, these are these are courtesy of uh, of Anthony Scroggins. Uh, he's been posting these up for months now uh, on his Patreon. Um, all right, so yeah. let's talk about this. Let's start with this one, Tom. What's the first thing yeah. you notice here? Um, so, again, it's one of those real beefy mechs. Um, I love the arm design. The, and there, those are what AC twos what what is it what are they supposed to be uac two. yes yeah there, there's like five of them per arm five or six per arm i guess five yeah. i'm not sure there's a whole bunch it's of five, five. Yeah. Cool. yeah it's five yeah like that barrel end is so cool i'm, I'm really um that's going to be a great one to paint i think 
super fun. Um, I think it's a great design. It strays a little bit into the mecha terrain for me a little bit. And um, that, you know, could, because it has that kind of real broad and slopey kind of center torso that doesn't scream battle tech to me. Um, and same with the legs. The legs are a little bit too angular and too bulky. Uh, it reminds me of what was that RoboCop? Uh, ED ED two hundred nine ED, right? Yep, uh, two hundred nine. Yeah. yeah, the bad guy. Yeah, it reminds me of that yep. a little bit, um, which I also love that neck. But yeah, so so um, can we see the back? Does it have a back shot? There we go. The back is a great design. You sort of see how it's that like real wide hip you know, kind of childbirthing mm -hmm. hips right there. And um, <laughs> pretty cool. I like it. I would, I would give it like a, a 6 out of 10. Just because, one, again... One interesting like, feature on this Mac. Have you seen... I don't know if, everyone always talks about the UACs on the Kraken, but it's actually got four machine guns on there. And oh, the really? machine guns are in the right torso. Yeah, if you look at the... If you go back to the oh, first yeah, picture, yeah. I think the machine wow. guns... It's like the big sound box on the top of its right torso. Yeah, that oh, yeah. It's a really weird machine gun. I think that's it anyway. I think they're the four machine guns. I don't know. I'd have oh, to go. Yeah. I'd have to go to Mega Mac to figure out where oh, everything yeah. is located. Like a quick, a quick rating out of ten. What would you give it? So it's funny because when I look at it uh, and I close one eye, it almost looks like the penetrator to me. Um, I kind of agree that you know it's. I mean, I love the arms. That's definitely the hallmark of this thing. But yeah, the rest of it, it's it's cool. It's not like my favorite, um, but it's cool. I would definitely enjoy painting it up and fielding it, and it would look great, um, you know, uh, in my you know clan wolf or whatever force. But um, it doesn't it doesn't blow me away. I do love though the heavy dutiness of the legs. Just the sheer like the the, the power in these joints is just like. I mean, the child birthing hips. I love that. Um, it is. It, it is looks like cool. an, it looks like an offensive tackle. Yeah, to me. It's a big offensive time. tackle. Like an offensive tackle or an offensive tackle. An offensive tackle. Yeah, you know, like. Um, I, yeah, I know. I'm a just big chunky boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Aaron, all I asked you for was a rating of ten. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm going to give it a six out of ten. Also. Okay. Tom, what do you think? Harsh. Harsh. Um, I, I really like this. I'd give it a 7.5, but I just love those weird quirky well, legs. Just, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. No, I like it. It's, it's very cool. Yeah, well, I mean, this has a really great core, by the way. You know, we're doing like the one bite, you know, uh, Dave Portnoy ratings. So, six, six out of ten. <laughs> but... Gotta love it. Gotta love it. All right. Well, listen, we're going to wrap up there. Um, this was this was another great episode, guys. Appreciate the conversation. Uh, I hope all of you out there enjoyed the conversation as well. A couple of closing things. Number one, check out Aries Games and Minis. Uh, fantastic source for all of your battle tech needs. Uh, and two, uh, head on over to Terrainify. Check out what they've got as well. Uh, really spice up your tabletop. Uh, great hills and spires and all sorts of cool things uh, that uh, that you can get. Uh, that said, I mentioned it earlier. I'll mention again, subscribe, 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 give us a like, leave a comment, share us around on the internet, help to get the, the name out there. Uh, and of course, if you want to help out more, uh, you can throw us a dollar uh, or more over on Patreon, unlock exclusive uh, patron perks and things like that. But that's it. I'm all done. Uh, guys, thank you so much for watching and hanging out with us on this fine Sunday morning. And of course, stay tuned. Always great stuff coming from Death From Above Wargaming. Have a great day.